Uh, good morning, everybody. You can kind of see that the stage is empty here. Uh, Faye and Randy uh, had to leave town to go do a funeral yesterday. And uh, Randy told me that they could leave about 9.30 last night, to the long trip home. And I told him, I said, we, we would rather you uh, not do that and get home safely rather than, than try to be here. So we are doing our famous PowerPoint with the no Faye and no Randy. So you will hear their voices, uh, but you will not see them. And it's not that we're not putting them on stage, it's they're really not there. So, yeah, that's, Vicki has a good idea. Maybe we can just get cutouts for when we do this and they can just have these big full-size cutouts right there. So if, Randy and Faye, if you guys are watching, we'll really miss you guys, but we'll, we'll get on without you. So Vicki, let's uh, do the first song. <laughs> All right, well, we're excited that you're here and we want to start worship this morning with my redeemer. You can stand, you can sit, however you worship. that you're here and we want to start worship this morning with my redeemer. You can stand, you can sit, however you worship. It's good. I know he's rescued my soul. His blood is calling my sin. I believe. Good morning. Two things, Facebook and YouTube, if you're going to try to uh, mute us on this, we have Faye and Randy's uh, permission to uh, use their music. So that is not, uh, 
we're not using somebody's uh, music without their, their permission, we are able to use that. So, that being taken care of, I know I said there was two things, but I can't remember what the other one is, so we're just doing one thing. Vicky says that I need to cut down on the, um, the humor while I'm up here anyway. So, um, I was looking at our tech team there while they're, uh, they're communicating. We don't really have any announcements um, this morning, uh, but uh, we do. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I got very distracted there. Let's do our scripture for today. Uh, we, and uh, it's uh, Psalms 119, verses 1 through 8. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. They have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart. And when I le lean, oh, sorry, when I learn your righteous judgments, I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and that you will not forsake us. And Lord, we pray that as, as we begin our service, Lord, uh, that the words that we say, the, the songs that we sing, Lord, the, uh, the message that we hear, but more importantly, Lord, our hearts glorify you this morning. Lord, we want to, to worship you with everything that we are. We're not, we are few in numbers in the building, Lord, but we know that you are here with us, and it doesn't matter what what the amount of people in here, you are always with us. And so we thank you for that. So let's, uh, as we begin our service, Lord, we just want to welcome you here, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Oh 
So we just enjoy Randy and Faye's music so much, and we think it's important to know those first verse, verses over and over again, um, that we played them over and over again so that we can really get them into our hearts. And so I uh, appreciate you guys uh, putting up with my, uh, <laughs> my uh, mistakes over there. So um, we are doing communion today, um, and so if you've got uh, one of these little handy-dandy things. You could kind of open up the clear cellophane on the top to get the uh, that uh, wafer uh, uh, ready for you. But I like to read to you what, uh, what Paul said about uh, communion. This is out of 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's what we're doing this morning. That's what these, these uh, emblems, the 
the wafer represents his body that was broken and the juice his blood that was spilt. So uh, I'm going to uh, pray for our, our wafer because it says that, that before he passed it to his disciples, he prayed for it. So let's pray now. Well, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. Thank you that Jesus was willing to come, willing to, to go through the pain and agony that he went through uh, the, leading up to the cross and on the cross, Lord. Not just because you wanted him to, and that was a big part of it, but because he loved us so much. So, Lord, we thank you for, for your love for us. As John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we might have a relationship with him. So as we take this bread, Lord, let us remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So the uh, Bible says that Jesus then took the juice uh, and prayed for it. And I'm going to ask that, uh, Richard, would you pray for our, our juice, please? Amen. So Jesus says, as often as we do this, do this in remembrance of him. All right, we, uh, we are continuing our series on uh, the fruits of summer, the, uh, the fruits of the spirit that, that Jesus talks about, or uh, Paul talks about, and uh, this is our second our, our second uh, message in the series, and it's, uh, it's entitled, How is Your Love Life? And uh, our passage today is, is going to be out of Galatians 5, 22 through 23, which is our uh, foundation verse for the whole uh, series. A teacher in an adult education creative writing class told the class to write, I love you, in 25 words or less without using the words, I love you. She gave them 15 minutes to do that, and a woman in class spent about 10 minutes looking at the ceiling and wiggling in her seat. In the last five minutes, she wrote frantically and finished just as time ran out. And as part of the class, you had to read to the class what you wrote, and this is what she wrote. I've seen lots worse haircuts than that, honey. These cookies are hardly burnt at all. Cuddle up, I'll get your feet warm. See, this lady had been shown love from her husband. Guys, the bar has been set high for us, and we need to get to work. But as we continue into our series of the fruits of summer, we're going to look into God's word, and we're going to see what it tells us about love this morning. We're going to look at different kinds of love and see whether we should just be saying, I love you casually and making part of our, our daily talk, or should we be showing it more in actions than in words? In this series, we're going to see if we can find some answers to a few questions. Questions like, how do I know if God is working in me? What evidence do I have that shows me that God's spirit is in me? And how can others see God working in me? And I hope that when we're done with this series, those questions and many others will be answered by, uh, for us, not, not by me from the, the pulpit, but from God's word and by the Holy Spirit. Well, last week we began our series by looking at, we didn't, we didn't begin by looking at the spiritual fruits, but we looked at where the fruit comes from and how we can bear good fruit. And we saw that we need to abide, to stay, to remain attached to the vine that is Jesus. And it's in him that we draw uh, whatever we need to be bearers of good spiritual fruit. Today we're going to begin to, uh, to look at the fruit of the Spirit. And the first fruit we're going to look at is the fruit of love. 
Today, we're going to be asking the question, how is your love life? Now, if you looked at our website to see what today's message was going to be called, or you looked in the bulletin and saw the title of the message, and you thought this was going to be a message about physical intimacy, you're going to be disappointed. The love life that we're going to be talking about this morning is the life that we are living, and if we are showing the, the spiritual fruit of love. Before we start uh, to look at the issue of love, I want us to turn to Galatians 5. And for this series, verses 22 and 23 are going to be the passage that we use as a launching pad as we begin our look at the fruits, of, uh, whatever fruit the, uh, we're looking at that week. But in Galatians 5, Paul talks to us about the contrast between walking by the flesh versus walking by the Spirit. And one of the things we need to understand is that when we walk by the Spirit and we are led by the Spirit, we are not under bondage to sin and the pull of our old nature. We are driven by something better. Walking by the Spirit helps us to conquer and overcome walking in the flesh. And before we look at our foundation verses uh, in verses 22 and 23, I, I want us, and I think it's important for us to look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the verses right before that, for a moment so that we can see what the life of walking in the flesh looks like and then compare it to what life walking in the Spirit looks like. So let me read to you Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, uh, enmities, in, in, in strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, fractions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, for which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But now we're going to look at what a spirit-filled life looks like in verses 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, let me ask you, of those two things, which kind of life sounds better to you? See, Paul uh, calls those things in verses 21, uh, 19 through 21, the deeds of the flesh. In other words, those are, are the ways that we can tell if we are being controlled by the flesh or being controlled by the Spirit. See, did you notice that verse 22 starts out with the words, but? See, what Paul is presenting to us is a choice. We can choose to live by the flesh or we can live by the Spirit. The choice is deceiving because if we are really abiding in Jesus, we can't help but live the life by the Spirit. And we use the singular form of the word fruit in in the fruit of the Spirit. And it shows us that God wants us to know these qualities are in unity. They come as a complete package, like a bunch of grapes, the, a bunch of grapes that all come from the same vine branch. And these qualities are found growing in all believers. And fruit is, is what something that, that uh, a, a fruit tree produces naturally. And when a tree is rotten, it naturally produces rotten fruit. Look at Matthew 7, uh, 17. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. But when we give our lives to Jesus, and he sends the Spirit of God himself into the, in the form of the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, we feel his mighty power, and good things begin to happen. The nature of God himself begins to show itself in our lives. And these are called the fruits of the Spirit, because the Spirit is the source of the fruit. What we do in the flesh is, are the works of man. The fruit of the Spirit are the works from God. And when God is in us and we allow his Spirit to work in us, these are natural byproducts of him working in us. See, we've all heard the poem about true love. It goes like this. If you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it was and always will be yours. If it never returns, it was never yours to begin with. But I found that someone had added a second verse. It was probably a wife and mom. If it just sits in your living room, messes up your stuff, eats your food, uses your telephone, takes your money, and never acts as if you actually set it free in the first place, you either married it or gave birth to it. The first fruit we'll look at the, uh, in our series is the fruit of love. And the way we love each other can tell us a lot about how much God has control of us. 
And during Paul's day, Greek was the language used in most of the Roman world. In that language, we find four major words for love, and they each had a fairly distinct meaning. In English, we have one word for love, and you have to know the context in which it's being used to, to know what is meant by it. See, we love the lo local taco truck, and we love a song on the radio, and we love our kids and our family, and we love Jesus. And each of those things we love, we love in a different way. In the original language of the New Testament, that's not the way it works. You can look at the word and generally know what is meant by that word. So how is your love life? What is the foundation of your love for others? So we're going to look at those four types of love this morning. And by doing that, I think we can get a better understanding of what kind of love qualifies as being part of the fruit of the Spirit. The first thing we're going to do is uh, and ask ourselves, is our love based on what others can do for us? See, this is a selfish kind of love. It's a love that's rooted in what another person can do for you. And it's the lowest kind of love. It's a love that's based in selfishness. In the Greek, uh, the Greek word used uh, for that love is uh, eros, eros. And it's where we get the word erotic. By the way, as far as I can find, this word for love is not used anywhere in the New Testament. And this kind of love is a passionate love that was often tainted by lust. And this kind of love always tries to use the object of Eros love to fulfill its own hunger for excitement and emotional intoxication. This is the young man who loves the cheerleader because of what she does for him. He loves her because of how she makes him look when she's on his arm. And he will love her as long as she meets his physical needs. Jack's grandfather left him $10 million. And the next week, Diane agreed to marry him. And after three months of married life, Jack noticed that his beautiful new wife was ignoring him more and more. Whenever they went out in public, she ignored him and, and flirted with other men. And finally, he decided to confront her. Diane, he says, was, was the only reason you married me was because my grandfather left me $10 million when he died? Don't be ridiculous, she replied. I don't care who left you the money. But you see a lot of movies and TV shows with this kind of love being demonstrated. It's so easy to fall into the trap of loving others only because of what they can do for us. It's easy to love someone because of what they can give us and what we want. When we have this type of love for others, we tend to use people and value things. We hear stories all the time about some 20-something uh, woman marrying an 80-year-old rich guy. She says it's because she loves him, but in reality, she loves his money. And when we have this type of love for others, we won't do what's best for them. We will use them for our own gratification. And this kind of love is not the kind of love from God. It is the, the kind of love from the world. And it's definitely not the love from the fruit of the Spirit. 1 John 2.17 says, The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. See, this type of love is totally selfish in nature. It's always looking out for number one. Just like the young man in this next story. At the end of their first date, a young man takes his favorite girl home. And emboldened by the night and how well things went, he decided to try for that important first kiss. And with an air of confidence, he leans with his hand against the wall and smiling, he says to her, darling, how about a good night kiss? Horrified, she replied, are you crazy? My parents will see us. Oh, come on, who's going to see us at this hour? No, can you imagine if we get caught? Oh, come on, there's nobody around. They're all sleeping. No way, it's just too risky. Oh, please, please, I like you so much. No, no, and no, I like you too, but I just can't. And it goes on like that for a few more minutes with him begging and her standing her ground. When suddenly the porch light goes on and the, sisters, uh, the girl's sister shows up in her pajamas, hair's all messed up from sleeping. And in a sleepy voice, the sister says, Dad says to go ahead and give him a kiss, or I can do it, or he'll come down himself and do it if he has to. But for crying out loud, tell him to take his hand off the intercom button. We're going to move on and look at the second kind of love. Is your love based on the attractive qualities of others? 
See, the second type of love is a bit better than the first one, but it can still be a little bit selfish. It's uh, the kind of, I love you because, and then you fill in the blank. Have you ever gone out to pick up a puppy to take home? They all look cute, and then you pick one up, and then you decide it's a little bit too big, and then you go to the next one, and you don't like the, quite like the color of the fur, and then the next one has a funny-looking face. And finally, you find the one that you want, and it's perfect. It has all the qualities you want, and then you say that you love this one. Well, uh, Fila was a, was a wide kind of love, uh, both friendship and romance. It was the highest secular Greek word for, for love. Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love because of the word phila. And this love was less selfish than eros. It could be an attraction uh, to someone or something that had lovable qualities. Phila is the warm love which we feel for our nearest and, our, and those closest to us. It's a kind of a thing of the heart. It's a kind of love that's expressed by a kiss. This love typically was one that you had because of someone or something had attractive qualities. Eros is, is flesh-driven. Phila is more emotional in nature. It's a good love, a friendship love, but not the love given as a fruit of the Spirit. See, this kind of love doesn't sound bad, but think of that puppy illustration again. Remember that one, it was too big? Well, how long before your perfect puppy gets that big? Or how long until his fur is the same color as the one you didn't like? Aristotle said that when the loved one's beauty fades, the phila sometimes fades too. Relationships built only on this will fail because the object of your love is going to change. And this type of love has some dependency in common interests as well. It's what we base friendships on. Usually people who are friends have, have something in common. It might be hobbies or kids or similar backgrounds, work or belonging to the same group or community. In James 2.23 it says, And so it happens, just as the scripture said, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. See, Jesus calls us his friends as he did Abraham when we have made God's interests our own. Listen to John 15, verses 14 and 15. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. See, this love is better than the first one, but it's still lacking because when the object of our love changes, our love is going to change as well. So we're going to move on. We're going to look at our third kind of love. So is your love based on focused, focusing on the family? See, this third type of love was a narrower term, reserved for family love, and it's, it's limited to the family circle. And this kind of love resists embracing outsiders. It's the natural instinctive love of a parent for a child or a child for their parent. And this Greek uh, uh, love was called storge. And this kind of love we will naturally have, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not the, the love of the fruit of the Spirit, but it's good and it's natural unless we use it in a wrong way. This is a love that says we will only love those in our family. And I think that most of us would consider this congregation part of our family. And I believe most churches feel the same. To, po to quote a Bill Gaither song, I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice that we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory, this family so dear. From the door of an orphanage to the house of a king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. See, being part of the family of God, being part of, of a church family feels so good, doesn't it? 
But in the church, we have to make sure that we don't fall into a trap. If the church is not careful, we can become so inwardly focused to the point that the only ones we love are the ones who are already in our church family. And we can tell if this has happened to us when we lose our passion to reach the loss. When our sole focus is on the people in our congregation, when our commission to reach the lost comes second to our desire to cater to programs that make us more comfortable. Churches that are inward focused die because they don't really show God's love to those outside of the circle. That church's love is is withheld if you're not part of that congregation. And sometimes we might extend that love to another congregation as fellow believers, but hold back a little bit because they're really not us. We're going to move to our final point. Is your love based on the standard that God has set? And I know that there's four points to this week's message, but I didn't hear anyone complaining when there was only two points last week. So it all works out even. The third point was a little one, so it almost didn't count anyway. This last kind of love is agape love. It's the kind of love that we find in John 3.16. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son. God gave his son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. Agape love is not merely something that God does. It's the heart behind everything that he does. As we abide in Jesus, this becomes true of us as well more and more. Agape love is unconditional, self-sacrificial love. It's the highest form of love originating from God himself. It's the love we see in 1 John 4, 8 and uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 that they read at weddings all the time. Agape love is always displayed in action. God's agape love is displayed most clearly to the world on the cross. Listen to 1 John 4, 9 and 10. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as sacrifice to take away our sins. Agape love calls us to love others like Jesus loved us. And when we let the world see that we love one another and see that we love them as well, God reveals himself to the world. This is the kind of love that that we are to have for others. This is the love that will be evident when the Spirit is working in us. Not the other three kinds, but agape love will be evident in our lives. According to the College Press commentary on Galatians, agape became almost exclusively the Christian word for love. For people familiar with agape in the New Testament, it's surprising to find out that this great word is almost never used in pre-biblical Greek. This is saying that before Jesus, agape love was almost unknown. A verb form was used occasionally by the Greeks, but they found uh, found in it nothing of the power or magic of eros and little of the warmth of phila. Thus, at the end of the Greek classical period, the language had a word for love that had been little used as a verb and almost as a noun, never at all. But agape is a love that is chosen by the will of the lover, not by the loveliness of the one loved. It is a love that is freely given without counting the cost or calculating what someone can get out of it. It goes deeper than mere emotion, and it lasts longer than mere attractiveness, and it reaches wider than simple family bloodlines. Agape means unconquerable compassion. It means no matter what a man may do to us by way of insult or injury or humiliation, we will never seek anything else but good for him. Agape love is not revenge. It's a kind of loving that's from the mind as much as from the heart. It concerns the will as much as the emotions. It describes the deliberate effort which we can uh, make only with the help of God to never seek anything but the best, even for those who seek the worst for us. God loves us because of who he is, not who we are. God will always do what is best for us. God sees and takes care of our needs. When we love with God's kind of agape love, we will see and meet meet people's 
true needs. We should realize the need of people to be changed through Jesus' grace and sacrifice and do everything uh, possible to bring them into a, a, a saving relationship with Jesus. It's interesting that in Matthew 5.44, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And not just love them, but to pray for them. And listen to what he says. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not pray that they get whatever they deserve or that something bad happens to them, but pray that they come to know what Jesus did for them and how much he loves them. Jesus uses the word agape, not philo. For the believer, when we deal with people who are lost, we need to see their need for Jesus and do everything that we can to meet that need in their lives in whatever manner that's necessary. Jesus doesn't use the word philo because he doesn't want us to have friendships. Friendships are important to us as humans, but if we really feel philo love for them, we're going to want to see them connected to God. And when we start to love by God's standards, the standard he used when choosing to love us, life is going to change. We will accept people as they are and love them too much to let them stay that way. God doesn't love us because of our looks or what we can do for him. God loves us because God chooses to love us in spite of ourselves. Fruit is a byproduct. It takes time to grow and requires care and cultivation. The spirit produces the fruit. Our job is to get in tune with the spirit. Believers exhibit the fruit of the spirit not because they work at it, but simply because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. This week uh, up at work, I ran into my friend Brian up at camp. Uh, you might remember him when he came and he gave his testimony a few months uh, ago. Um, he's, he's the big tall guy with the beard uh, that works in the canopy tours. We call him Bigfoot. Uh, just one of those guys that if you talk to him for a fraction of a second, you will find out that he loves Jesus and he wants that for you. Well, he came through the office while I was in there and I asked him how he was doing. And he kind of hesitated. And then he said, I'm filled. And I looked at him and I told him that he has never been filled since he's met Jesus. He's always overflowing. See, and that's where this agape love comes from. The overflowing of being filled with Jesus. Of abiding in him. Of being the branch firmly attached to the vine. The fruit of the Spirit separates Christians from godless from a godless evil world. It reveals a power within them and it helps them become more like Jesus in their daily lives. So let me ask you, how is your love life? If we let the Spirit control us, we're going to find that we will love like we have never loved before. Uh, we're going to, Randy and Faye, through the miracle of uh, technology, is going to lead us in a final song. And if you'd like to come and pray at the altar this morning, you can come and do that. If you would like to share a prayer request with me, I'll be standing right here at the front. If God is leading you to a decision this morning, church membership, baptism, or giving your life to Jesus for the first time, then you can come too. But whatever God has put on your heart this morning, respond as he leads. If you are watching online and you have a decision that you would like to share with us, then please um, Get in contact with us. All our contact information is uh, on whatever site that you're watching us on right now. But may God have his will in our lives today. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we want to love you with that spiritual fruit, that agape love. So, Lord, I'm asking right now that, that we open up our hearts and that we allow you to, to grow the spirit of agape love in us. That, Lord, that we can uh, look at our lives and, and, and look at those four kinds of loves, Lord, and, and make sure that we, we kind of get rid of that first one, Lord, and get more of the agape love. Lord, whatever decisions that you have put on the hearts of the people, Lord, we want to give to you this morning. So, Lord, we ask that you do what you want this morning. And we pray this in your name. Amen.
loving you. benediction today comes from Hebrews 13 verses 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>